so it's my great honor to introduce the speaker. And today we have Professor John Ringwood, so from Manos University, Ireland. So a quick introduction of John. He received his honor degree diploma, uh, electrical engineering from TU Dublin and BSc in electrical engineering from Trinity College Dublin, both in 1981. He got his PhD degree from Strathclyde in 1984, and he subsequently received an MA degree in musical technology from Monmouth University in 2005. He spent 15 years in Dublin State University as a member of academic staff in the School of Electrical Electronic Engineering with concurrent terms as a visiting academic in Massey University and the University of Auckland. He joined Manus University in 2000 as a chair professor and founding head of the Department of Electronic Engineering and built the de department from a Greenfield site. And also serving as dean of engineering from 2001 to 2006. He's currently professor of electronic engineering and director of the Center for Ocean, Ocean Energy Research in Manus University. He's associate editor of Agro Transactions on Sustainable Sustainable Energy and the Journal of Ocean Engineering and Maritime Energy and Deputy Subject Energy for Editor for IET Renewable Power Generation. John received the 2016 IEEE Control Systems Magazine Outstanding Paper Award and was awarded the prestigious a French government award in 2017 for his contributions to ocean energy research. In addition to over 400 peer reviewed publications, he is a co author of the book Hydrodynamic Control of Wave Energy Devices and holds three patents. His commercialization activities, which include the Spin Out Company, Wave Venture, has been recognized by Enterprise Ireland 2008 Industrial Technology. Commercialization Award and the Manos University 2013 Commercialization Award. His research are in control systems, ocean renewable energy, and the biomedical engineering. And today he'll be talking about energy maximizing control for wave energy systems and extreme seeking problem. And if you have any questions, as Tiago mentioned, you can type in the chat window or in the end, we'll have a QA session. And without further delay, John, and yours. Very well. well, thanks a million, uh, Bing, for the lovely introduction, and thanks to Tiago for the invitation to give this talk. I'll just try uh, sharing my screen now. Hopefully, it will work okay. Can people see this okay? Yes. Right. Um, so um, I, I feel like a little bit of an imposter uh, giving a talk to TC 1.2, which is concerned, I think, with uh, learning and adaptive systems. And while I might know a little bit about wave energy and its control, it is, is not matched by a, a same level of expertise in adaptive and learning systems. So uh, really what this is, 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 is more of a problem definition than, than the uh, exposition of some elegant solution in, in the data-driven world. But I'm hoping that uh, some uh, better equipped people uh, on the call may have some ideas about how we can approach this. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I, I'll give some um, attempts that have been made to, to, to look at uh, data-driven and data-based uh, control for, for wave energy systems. Um, uh, but I guess most of the time I'm going to spend describing the problem. Um, explain the motivation, uh, which is probably clear for, for the need for wave energy and the need to control it well. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, wave energy converter models and their control. Uh, talk about the sensitivity and robustness issues that arise in wave energy systems, and then spend a little bit of time looking at a few solutions um, that, that point in the direction of data-based or data-driven uh, control, and then finish off with some perspectives. So the motivation is is uh, reasonably clear. I mean, um, I guess a lot of jurisdictions in the world have now installed a lot of wind energy, uh, but relying on, on a single mode of renewable energy can be a, a dangerous business, as we found out even in the last couple of weeks in Ireland, where we had relatively high pressure with no wind and, and freezing conditions. Um, but the installed global uh, wave energy capacity is still relatively low. 
Um, and one of the reasons for that is because of the cost of energy. But uh, people believe that effective control can maximize the value uh, of wave energy assets and bring down the levelized cost of energy. Um, so why is it so difficult to harness wave energy? Well, it, th there are a, a mixture of kinetic and potential energies in waves. Um, uh, as a result, and, and in addition to that, the harnessing principle um, that you might use to convert wave energy into, say, electrical energy is not clear. There are at least over 200 prototypes uh, that have been proposed, many which looked very, very different from each other. The energy flux is reciprocating, uh, unlike in the case of wind, where it's unidirectional. And that uh, reciprocating energy flux has to be rectified at some stage, which can be done at the hydrodynamic, the aerodynamic, the mechanical, electrical uh, stages. And the earlier that is done, generally, the better. But that involves um, you know, a level of, of, of extra complexity. It's generally wave, wave power uh, or wave force is generally high uh, and, and the velocities or the rates of movement are relatively low, which result in large mechanical stresses, which, which are a cost driver. Uh, and also the, the, the speed of movement is low while gen electrical generators like relatively high speed or high velocity. Also, uh, it's difficult to limit the hydrodynamic power uh, impact on a device and that becomes problematic given the large variability in wave power. So. Generally, uh, systems are over-designed uh, in, in terms of um, how they're going to survive the worst extremes while, while being efficient in, in the sort of uh, average sea state. Uh, or there's a survival strategy, which means that the device uh, actually shuts down for these more energetic sea states and we capture no energy at all in those situations. From a control perspective, one of the things we can do something about, but it is, is a complexity, is that the uh, wave excitation frequencies uh, are broadbanded. Uh, so each C state is composed of a whole set of different frequencies. And of course, if we're trying to get the system to resonate in this reciprocating way, uh, then um, the, those multiple frequencies potentially are problematic and also we have C state changes as well. So that set of frequencies changes uh, from time to time as well. Just a couple of or a few different uh, wave energy prototypes. I'm not going to go through them all, but really the, the, the conclusion to draw from this picture is that there are many and varied. So, so this one up here uses an oscillating water column to drive an air turbine. This is an overtopping device where the uh, the head uh, uh, it's it's a low head turbine that's used uh, and that's unidirectional. So the rectification in that case is hydrodynamic. This is a, a two body device. The 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 brown and the the uh, the sort of green part are separate, so they move relative to each other and thus captured by these hydraulic rams here. Uh, same hydraulic rams here because these pontoons pitch relative to the central platform and finally this one here is bottom mounted so it has um, what's called an oscillating wave surge converter which moves back and forth with the waves so many and very different uh, principles and this is yet another one which is maybe something you might not expect um, one of the, the the nice features of this is that you can pitch the blades it, it operates on lift forces and it goes in a single direction so the rectification is 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 if you like automatic and you can limit the hydrodynamic power on the device through pitching of these blades here from a control engineer's perspective it's it's quite interesting because you have four different control effectors uh, all of which can be used to to maximize the energy capture and indeed uh, to also mitigate some uh, stress loading as well. And that's the subject of a, of a European uh, project with 10 partners at the moment. This is a slide that's particularly interesting in relation to, uh, let's say, any move towards extremum seeking control, uh, since this quantifies the, uh, the, the excitation or the wave resource. So you'll see that for different steady wind velocities, assuming that we have um, the waves built up over uh, a long enough distance or fetch. Uh, so it's we're talking about fully developed seas. Um, as you increase the steady wind, then, then you get an increase in the, the size of the waves and also the bandwidth of the waves and the sort of central frequency um, moves down or the period moves up 
Um, so generally, uh, longer wavelength waves, they, they travel a little bit faster as well, and, and they have a longer period. Um, in terms of quantifying uh, that, that's normally done with these um, spectral models. So I've just given a variety of names here, so Pearson Moscovich, Brett Schneider, John Swap, and Achi Hubble. Um, but unfortunately, uh, those models don't always represent real data, as we can see in the right hand uh, panel here, because um, the real data is uh, is given by both the blue dashed line and the gray one. I hope you can see that. And the model that's fitted to it is the red one. That that's a single mode model, uh, but multi frequency model. Uh, and the, the the peak of the the, the model spectrum. Uh, actually, there isn't a whole lot of real energy in the waves at that point. So we have to be a little bit careful in how we quantify them. But essentially, the, the, one of the difficulties, as we, we might explore data-driven control, is this broad-banded excitation that we're really trying to control uh, with respect to. OK, so the, uh, the general control challenge or control objective is to reduce the levelized cost of wave energy to compete with other renewable and non-renewable sources. And levelized cost of energy is simply costs divided by the amount of energy converted. And that comes into euro per kilowatt hour or dollars per kilowatt hour, depending on which jurisdiction you're in. And costs are generally made up of capex and opex, and you can add in uh, commission and decommissioning costs as well. So the reason that we're interested in, in trying to address this or reduce the levelized cost of energy for wave energy is because control technology has been assessed to have the capability of increasing power capture for wave energy devices by a factor of two to three. So uh, with regard to LCOE, if you increase the bottom by a factor of three, then you reduce LCOE by a factor of three, assuming the capex and opex are independent of your control actions, which is not always entirely the case. And uh, in terms of, you know, spending, let's say, uh, you know, a million dollars on, on a one megawatt device for a wave energy device, uh, the addition of control capability, uh, you know, it might be a little bit trite to say this, but it is primarily, a, a, you know, a software utility we're going to add with maybe some sensors and, and some actuators. Uh, so look at some, some uh, models, um, certainly the, the you know, prescient words by George Box are very relevant in the wave energy case. All models are surely wrong. Uh, some are useful in, in, in different uh, domains. And in terms of their uses, then we can list off the following. So we can use models to assess power production. That would be done by um, project developers who are thinking of putting um, wave energy devices in a particular location, uh, a farm, uh, to produce power for utility to assess uh, loadings uh, or forces on the system under extreme sea conditions. So we make sure that the device is going to be um, there, um, regardless of the sea conditions it might meet. Um, simulation and uh, yeah, simulation of device and array motion. Uh, so we can, we need to do that for a variety of reasons. One is to uh, optimize the geometry layout. Um, oh, sorry, the array layout or, or, or the geometry of, of the devices, the physical geometry, and also, of course, to evaluate the effectiveness of control strategies. And there are a whole range of models of differing fidelity and indeed computational complexity that we can use in, 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 in this function here. Um, and of course, uh, we need models as a basis for model-based control design. But of course, in, in uh, TC 1.2, uh, there's more interest in, in looking at data-driven uh, control. And uh, that's where I'm hoping to get to. And what I'm going to do is point out the difficulties, in fact, in model-based control design for wave energy systems. And there is no single model that, that does all of these functions here, uh, given the, the variety of fidelities and computational complexities involved. The whole system uh, consists of a number of potential changes of energy domain. Uh, over here, we have the waves themselves. They, they uh, manifest uh, themselves as, as an excitation force on the device, uh, which produces a certain velocity of the device. We have an opposing force, which is actually the control force, uh, which may be affected by hydraulic cylinders, or indeed directly by a linear generator or a rotational generator. Uh, so we also have a range of, uh, uh, of control inputs then, which could be um, some bypass valves here where we recruit more or less 
uh, in terms of the number of hydraulic cylinders. In a hydraulic motor, we can change the swash plate angle, we can change the excitation current in the generator, uh, depending on the nature of the generator, and then the conduction angle in the power converters. And probably the most familiar one is, is this one here. So that's our control input. And ultimately that puts an opposing force uh, into the, uh, the, the device that allows us to generate uh, useful power. So there are multiple changes in the form or, or, or domain of the power from hydrodynamic, mechanical, hydraulic, and electrical. Uh, we have these variety of control inputs. Um, I guess down here we could also model a grid and, and, and we do that from time to time depending on, on which part we're, we're looking at. And there are uh, different ways uh, to, to model these, these systems in an integrated way and bond graphs uh, provide uh, one of those. I'm going to take a really simple system just to give some sort of an illustration of uh, and put some form on what I'm talking about. So th this is, is just a heaving buoy. We assume it, it only goes in the vertical or heave direction with velocity V. It's subject to wave excitation force uh, FEX. And this is the power takeoff. So basically the buoy moves relative to uh, the static reference of the seabed. And this is the power takeoff, which you could imagine is a linear generator. And by virtue of our control action on that linear generator, we can manipulate this force here, F U of T, which is our control force, which is the solution to the control problem. So the useful converted power is simply force times velocity, that's mechanical power. And energy, of course, is just the integral over time over period T uh, of that power. In terms of models, the, the, the sort of gold standard at the moment uh, in terms of hydrodynamic uh, modeling are, are the Navier-Stokes equations, which are uh, a set of coupled uh, partial differential equations, uh, nonlinear partial differential equations, which are based on conservation of mass and momentum. Um, and, and they have various sort of simplified forms, um, uh, but they're still pretty complicated. And there is no closed form solution, although in the film Gifted, uh, which appeared in 2017, someone claimed to have a thesis uh, which had the closed form solution to the Navier-Stokes equation. I don't think anyone has uh, set eyes on it, to be honest. Um, however, you can solve these um, equations numerically by discretizing both uh, the, the physical domain and also the time domain. And uh, that, that then can be done either with regard to a, a fixed mesh, which is uh, computational fluid dynamics, or in terms of these particles, which is, is smooth particle hydrodynamics. And they're very, very complex in terms of uh, uh, computation. Typically for CFD, it's about a thousand seconds of simulation time for one second of, of real time. Um, so uh, usually some simplification is, is employed and uh, just looking at Newton's second law, then we basically have a sum of hydrodynamic forces on the right hand side here. The only one that's exceptional to that is the control force which we apply. And we're also making the assumption here that these are um, uh, a linear uh, superposition of hydrodynamic forces, which is in itself uh, an assumption. So we have mooring forces, radiation forces, diffraction forces, viscous damping forces. Um, this, this force is basically a balance between the restoring force uh, of buoyancy uh, and the effect of gravity on the, the mass of the device. And this is the wave excitation force, which I said a little bit about at the start in terms of being a broad banded uh, type of excitation. Uh, if we go all the way from Navier-Stokes right to a linear approximation, and we, we make lots of assumptions, which include these, uh, that, that the fluid is irrotational, incompressible, and inviscid. Uh, so that means we don't take fluid viscosity, for example, into account. And we have a small body approximation, which means that effectively the device is small, the device dimension is small compared to the wavelength, and that there are small oscillations. So. So basically the device doesn't move very much. And that's a normal um, you know, assumption in, in, uh, in linearization when you think about Taylor's theorem. You know, we usually throw off the, the higher order terms because we assume that delta X or the, the variation from equilibrium is small. And indeed that's exactly the, the case here, except that this is not necessarily a valid assumption uh, in this case. And I'll quantify that in a minute. 
So if you make all those assumptions, you 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 can uh, you can uh, approximate the excitation and diffraction forces by this convolution term here, where eta is the free surface elevation, and and uh, the, the integral of of this this quantity here is then the uh, the hydrodynamic force as a result of those. Uh, this is the radiation term, which again involves the convolution integral. Um, uh, the buoyancy force, which is basically just the spring term, and we assume the viscous force is zero. Remember, it's an assumption of, of uh, an inviscid fluid. And if we do all that, we get what's called Cummins equation, which is, is well known within the wave energy community. And on the face of it, it looks like a sort of a second order differential equation, but it's an integral differential equation, which has these convolution terms. These terms here, the um, HR and the HEX are hydrodynamic terms. They can be got from hydrodynamic solvers in non-parametric form. And then if we want, we, we can approximate these convolution terms uh, by finite order uh, differential equations, uh, typically between uh, second and, and sort of sixth order. Um, and that gives us something that, you know, is it reasonably easy to work with from a control perspective in terms of model-based control, uh, bearing in mind that we've made some significant assumptions along the way. And this assumption of linearization is one that that is is really quite challenged. Most people uh, and and most applications uh, subject themselves to linearization under controlled conditions in a reasonably uh, sensible way. So, for example, here if we had temperature uh, control in a room, and this was the set point here at 18 degrees Celsius, and we started from from uh, let's say 10 degrees. With maybe a little bit of overshoot, we reach the uh, the set point, and after that, the the effect of the control action is to drive the system towards that 18 degrees. So it seems perfectly reasonable to linearize around 18 degrees, while in the control case, what we're really trying to do is exaggerate the motion to to maximize the control objective, which is that integral of force times velocity. So after the control is applied at the, the green dashed line here, we actually get greater movement away from equilibrium, and that's the effect of the control action. So in fact, under controlled conditions, um, we're actually invalidating the linearizing assumptions upon which uh, the models that we might derive are based. Uh, yeah, so I can just, just little, oh, sorry. Uh, um, so you can just see see this uh, maybe in the animation a little bit more clearly. So on the top, uh, we have uh, the uncontrolled case. So basically the device is just following the wave. There's no external control force on the device. While in the bottom case, we have what's called latching control, which uh, when, when the device achieves its, its extrema, it's, it's held there for a short period and then released, which um, increases its potential energy and then it actually increases um, the, the, the amplitude of oscillation. And if you look at the phase plane, so on the vertical axis, we have relative velocity between the device and the free surface. And on the horizontal axis, then we've got the relative displacement between the device and the free surface. You'll see that the, uh, you know, the operational region for the controlled case, which is in red, is much larger than it is for the uncontrolled case. So again, this maybe illustrates well how difficult it is to assume uh, those conditions for linearization. Okay, um, e equally we can look at how these models perform against our gold standard of, of CFD, which again are based on a discretized version of the Navier-Stokes equations. And I won't go through all these models in detail, but in essence, uh, under uh, controlled conditions, we have the, the, the X's and the O's for the non-controlled case. And under non-controlled conditions, remember the device just basically following the wave and its, its relative displacement being small, all the models check out pretty well. So fidelity is on the vertical axis here, and you can see we're approaching the fidelity of the gold standard of CFD. But as soon as we start controlling the device, then the fidelity of all these models pretty well falls away, uh, with only one of them performing reasonably well on the fidelity uh, scheme of things. And, and as we move from these the linear to CFD, we're sort of including more and more uh, nonlinear effects. Here we have the static fruit killer for excitation force. Here we have uh, nonlinear static and dynamic fruit killer forces. Both of these are the same. They're just implemented in different ways. This is a, an analytical solution, while this is a, a remeshing 
or numerical solutions. So this is more computationally complex. So it's a little bit further out on the right hand side here. Uh, and this also includes viscous drag. OK, so um, that was a little bit about models. Let's have a look at, at the control objectives um, for wave energy. So first of all, uh, we're trying to uh, maximize the energy absorption over our time interval T, uh, which ideally will lead to minimization of levelized cost of energy, and at the same time to minimize uh, the risk of component damage, which includes uh, you know, respecting physical constraints on the system and examining fatigue on the system as well, which might uh, result in premature failure. Usually that's distilled down to something like this, which is something that we can manage within a, a, a certainly a model-based control framework. Uh, so we want to maximize uh, the energy captured over a period T subject to these physical constraints on the system, which may involve constraints on displacement in terms of uh, control force uh, and in terms of the velocity on the system. And we may also have a constraint on Reverse power flow, which which might seem a little bit strange, um, but you can actually put power into the system, and maybe this will be obvious after a few more slides, uh, or the rationale for it, which actually helps to, to capture more power uh, overall. But it's a nonlinear constraint, so it's quite a, a nasty problem. So uh, wave energy systems uh, were examined, I, I guess, from a control perspective in around the 70s uh, initially. And uh, various people who came from the hydrodynamic world and the physics world and the mathematical world looked at this problem. Uh, the initial focus was on monochromatic waves or waves of a single frequency or a single period. And there are uh, very strong parallels with um, AC circuit analysis, or which include transmission lines um, or antenna coupling. Uh, and basically, what we're, in those cases, what you're trying to do is maximize power transmission between uh, a source and a sink. And in fact, it's exactly the same sort of problem we're trying to solve in wave energy. And it, it recently, actually, we showed that there's strong connections with tidal barrage control, which is maybe unsurprising, seeing that that's also driven by a harmonic function as well. So uh, going back to Cummins equation then, which is this one here, we're going to recast that in the, uh, the frequency domain just for control um, and uh, an easy control analysis. And we're going to uh, write the system in, in terms of this quantity here, Zi, which is the intrinsic impedance. And of course, impedance, mechanical impedance, is force divided by velocity. Uh, and we know that electrical impedance, of course, is is uh, v over, uh, is uh, voltage over current. So this intrinsic impedance is expressed in terms of the, the, the quantities in Cummins equation um, uh, as in equation 12. So this is the radiation damping term, which is got from, again, some hydrodynamic solver. So is the added mass. The added mass is the extra, um, I guess, water that, that clings to the device and, and forms an additional inertial term. And this is the sort of restoring force which comes from the uh, buoyancy and, and spring balance. So um, anyone uh, on the call who's uh, familiar with AC circuits will, will know that you maximize uh, the power transmission from the source uh, to the load if the load impedance is the complex conjugate of the internal impedance of the source. So the internal impedance of the source is this quantity here, this intrinsic impedance. So we just need to make sure the load impedance is the complex conjugate of that. And that maximizes the power transfer from the waves essentially through the device uh, into uh, the mechanical load. And we can represent this in, in a, a very simple feedback control structure. It's not the one you may be used to because we've no error here. We're not really tracking a set point. This is the external wave excitation force. This is the opposing force that, that uh, we impose as a result of the power takeoff. And the sum of the forces drives the device to give us uh, a certain velocity. And we're going to choose the power takeoff force to be um, this combination of terms here, which it looks like a PID controller, but it's not operating on an error. It's operating on the velocity. So this is the, 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 the function that's in this controller here. And we're going to choose it to be the complex conjugate uh, of the system, um, intrinsic impedance. So there's the system 
we're going to choose h to be this one here. Um, and that gives us overall a transfer function of one of our uh, twice this the radiation damping term. Uh, and effectively, that tells us or allows us to find what the optimum velocity is given the excitation force. But what's nice about this control structure is that it's a simple feedback control. So we just need to measure velocity and that allows us to form the optimal control force. Also, we don't actually need um, all of the terms in here. Um, you know, we only need a, a real and an imaginary part to form the complex conjugate. So in fact, it's a little bit over parameterized, but that gives us a little bit of flexibility. So uh, one of the difficulties with, with, with this construction here is that really this, this only works at a single frequency. So going back to this impedance matching problem, we can determine the optimal impedance here, but it only is good for a single frequency. So trying to deal with this broadband at excitation is, is slightly problematic. Um, also, uh, this feedback structure here, it doesn't really allow us to handle constraints. Um, and if we try to come up with a, a sort of theoretical panchromatic solution, it ends up being uh, equivalently either unstable or anti-causal. So we did develop a controller we, we call the LightCon. So it's, it's a linear time invariant um, controller. And effectively what it tries to do is that the, the black line here shows you the, uh, the optimum multi-frequency complex conjugate, which you can't realize, but we come up with the the sort of closest open loop realization that we can in, in, in this term here. And then we, we, we managed to do some constraint handling via this small k here. So that is a sort of a, a, an, an attempt to do it in a relatively simple way. Uh, and another way we can do it is, is to have a sort of a multi-frequency uh, solution, uh, which is called uh, by the authors a multi-resonant control, and then there's essentially interpolation between these, these different frequencies to, to cover the full broadband input spectrum. However, um, in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, um, MPC type techniques have been employed and, and uh, that gives us a, a, a control structure something like this. So, 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 for, so for some measurement of the excitation force, um, we determine an optimal velocity reference and then uh, we have a, a straightforward set point following control loop to achieve that. So we hope that the, the real velocity here tracks this reference velocity and this although I've represented it in a Laplace transform uh, shape, um, it, it's essentially the solution to a numerical optimization problem. And one of the nice things is because we, we, we're solving numerical optimization problem, we can solve a numerically constrained optimization problem, which allows us to deal with force, velocity, and uh, displacement constraints. But one of the difficulties is that we need to know this excitation force, which in fact isn't actually measurable. Um, it's only measurable when the device is held uh, fixed because then you can resolve the excitation force as the total hydrodynamic force, but otherwise you can't separate it from the other forces, hydrodynamic forces, if the device is moving. And also because the solution to this is generally uh, anti-causal, uh, we need future, future knowledge. But we can build estimators to estimate the excitation force and, and predictors to determine future values, and that's not a huge problem. There is also a, a benefit maybe instead of looking at the, the MPC problem as a sort of a typical zero order control or zero order hold um, type representation. And here you can see, you know, a typical sort of a multi harmonic function, which might be typical in a wave energy application. And you can see the, uh, the original function is in the, the sort of thick line. Uh, the zero order hold approximation, of course, gets better as the sampling period gets smaller, but so does the amount of computation. While if you use some other, you know, harmonic or multi-harmonic functions like Fourier or these half range Chebyshev Fourier functions, then you get a much better representation at a lower parameter count. So, for example, on the right hand, uh, well, well, below here, you can see the number of, of basis functions that you need. Uh, to to uh, achieve a certain level of fidelity. And the HRCF, you know, the, the fidelity becomes really good very quickly with a small number of functions. Um, so th there's benefit in going that route and the computation uh, drops off as well. So here in some, some equivalent tests, we show that we get at least the same amount of power capture 
from this receding horizon pseudo-spectral control using half-range Chebyshev Fourier functions, while the computation is, is only one third of that with the zero order hole type uh, MPC. And uh, this is just an example here of, of uh, uh, I guess, a numerical optimal control using the moment domain representation, which is not a million, million miles away from the pseudo spectral. Um, you'll see again, there's quite a bit of movement in the device uh, relative to the surface. So again, we're, we're exciting a lot of nonlinear uh, hydrodynamic effects. Um, but one of the nice things again, because we're doing this numerical optimal solution, is we're able to keep it within displacement constraints and control force constraints. Okay, uh, and, and just a few words about how to manage this excitation force that's unknown. So again, there's a variety of estimators we can use. The only trick is that it's not a state estimation problem, it's an input estimation problem. So. Um, I guess ostensibly we need a model for the system uh, or, or the input uh, to be able to to estimate it. Um, there is, uh, yeah, an, an optimal forecasting framework under Gaussian assumptions, which which talk about the level of fidelity you can achieve uh, with various measurements, um, upwave measurements, which you can do in this case here. But alternatively, you can just measure the the, the, the device displacement and velocity. And from that, you can infer an estimate of the excitation force. And then the forecast is relatively straightforward, in fact, with uh, autoregressive models. OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about sensitivity because this does impact uh, the, the issue as, as, as we may consider a database control. So uh, you'll, you'll recall, hopefully, uh, this picture here, which shows the operational space for the controlled in the red and the uncontrolled in the blue system. So. Uh, the assumption of small oscillations is challenged. Um, so if we have a model that's based on that assumption, it's likely to be inaccurate. Uh, we ignore viscous effects. Remember, Cummins' equation is assuming an inviscid fluid. And uh, the linear excitation and buoyancy forces are reasonable only when the, uh, the oscillating body has a uniform cross-sectional area. That means it's, let's say, cylindrical or, or, or something like that. Uh, while the, the, the circular uh, buoys that I showed you would violate that assumption. And, uh, you know, a lot of hydrodynamic models in tank tests are uh, often validated under uncontrolled conditions and then used in, in a control framework. There are also some other issues as well, like, for example, even um, with mesh-based numerical techniques, which might be CFD or boundary element, they have inherent numerical error, which require the use of convergence studies to uh, decide an, a, um, a reasonable cutoff point. Uh, tank test data itself has got limited resolution. They're invariably on model dynamics. And there's obviously a limit to the complexity that we can handle in a model-based control design, because in, in, in things like MPC, we need to compute uh, you know, a, an optimal solution uh, within a certain um, uh, control horizon. So if we were to, to take a look at the, uh, the, the ACC, which is this feedback controller, and, and to, um, uh, to look at its sensitivity properties, uh, we'd find that uh, they're actually not very nice, and I'll show you a picture of them in a minute, but essentially we're looking at the closed loop sensitivity here, or the sensitivity of the closed loop transfer function, to uncertainty uh, in uh, the system model. And we can also break that down into looking at the sensitivity of the closed loop system to individual mass and damping and spring terms. Um, just to remind you uh, what the two control structures look like, the, the ACC controller again is the feedback one, which is really, really simple. We just measure velocity here. We have to solve a numerical optimization problem, but we can take the um, we can take the uh, constraints into account, and we're going to look at the relative sensitivity properties of these two structures. So, for the ACC, if you look at the closed loop sensitivity and the sensitivity with respect to these individual parameters, you know it, it looks okay till you look at the, uh, the 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 vertical axis here, and this is in positive dBs. So the sensitivity function, in fact, is way worse than what it is for the open loop system. 
Uh, the only place it's reasonable is, is at this frequency here, which in fact is the resonant frequency of the device. And at that frequency, the controller is not doing anything because it doesn't actually need to move the resonant frequency of the device. But away from that frequency, these climb very, very steeply. And we have uh, what looks like a huge sensitivity problem, at least in terms of uh, the closed loop sensitivity. And that's for this, this simple example here. So uh, unfortunately, not only do we violate the linearization assumptions by using control, but control in a wave energy context also significantly degrades the system sensitivity properties. And whereas normally uh, we're used to, especially in, in, in something like a H-infinity control framework, we're used to minimizing the sensitivity uh, relative to the complementary sensitivity. However, uh, maybe that's not the, 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 the end of it. And, and we can also look at power production sensitivity in addition to closed loop sensitivity. And here, uh, we're just gonna look at the, uh, the, the, the effect on the power produced, the actual power produced relative to the normal power if there is no uh, uncertainty or modeling error. Uh, and we're going to look at that for relative errors in a real part and imaginary part of the intrinsic impedance. Um, the real part errors will correspond to radiation damping errors and the imaginary for inertial or stiffness errors. And uh, I, I'm just going to run through these fairly quickly, but, but in essence, we, we would hope for a value of one. And the ACC controller, as far as um, um, errors and damping, so that's real errors in the intrinsic impedance, it does pretty good. Uh, the, the, the AVT controller or, or this feed forward controller, not so good. Uh, and if you're going to get the, the, if you think you're going to have errors, you're better off erring on the safe side and having a positive error rather than a negative error. In terms of inertial and stiffness terms, uh, the AVT controller does really well. The, 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 that's the blue line here. We get nominal performance, in, in fact, for, for a whole range of errors, while it, things get pretty serious as far as the ACC controller is concerned. So they have a mix of sensitivity difficulties, but none of them is particularly good and both are sensitive. Uh, there's also a, an issue to do with the AVT controller because it needs an excitation force uh, estimate and forecast. Um, the ACC controller does not, the feedback controller does not, so it's got you know, insensitivity to those errors while uh, the AVT controller has some uh, sensitivity. So um, let me try and summarize the problem uh, as I say a few words about uh, data-based and data-driven. So it's a naturally nonlinear problem. The assumptions of linearization are really violated by the control itself. Um, yeah, nonlinear convex model-based controllers can be difficult to synthesize, especially uh, to, to compute them in real time, but there are one or two exceptions. Um, yeah, we, we do have some frequency domain modeling solutions with, with uh, non-parametric non control design that work okay. Uh, I've tried to illustrate that there are significant sensitivity issues, that the control actually doesn't help us in alleviating sensitivity. In fact, it exaggerates them. And uh, we have a consistent need to respect physical constraints, and we need future uh, and current uh, estimate uh, of the excitation force for optimal control. However, one thing that works in our favor here is that we have persistent excitation in the system. So in terms of an adaptive or learning system, uh, this may be useful. Okay, so let me say a few things about the possibilities for data-based and data-driven uh, control, uh, but I certainly look forward to having the input of the, the more educated community that's, uh, that's on the call. And, and uh, you know, I've been around a long time, pretty old in the tooth, and, and in my day, uh, you know, uh, data-based control was all really it divided into either self-tuning or adaptive control, which was a once-off or a continuous type of uh, adaptation. And then there were explicit and implicit schemes, but I guess these were all controller parameterizations. And the difference now in terms of data-driven control is that uh, we can have a starting point and a destination, which are both data, which means that we don't have a parametric form uh, necessarily for the controller. And this is going to be something that we'll see that we haven't achieved yet in, in wave energy control. So one uh, solution here that we've looked at is to use this uh, receding horizon pseudo-spectral control. 
uh, where all the state and control variables are represented in terms of these basis functions. And I mentioned this earlier on as a, an efficient representation. So the phi are the basis functions, and these are the coefficients of the basis functions here. And if we, we, we essentially take Cummins equation and we parameterize it in these terms, we get a system that looks something like this. So phi are the basis functions, x and v, are essentially the, uh, the, the pseudo spectral representations of the system states, which would be velocity and position, uh, or sorry, X and V are, are position and velocity. This is the control force. Um, and uh, then uh, that's the system model, which is subject to uh, these two uh, force quantities here, the excitation force, and we separate out the radiation force as it turns. Uh, turns out in this case. So the model is essentially in terms of these matrices M and N. And what we do in this particular solution here in, 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 uh, in this one is we start with nominal values for M and N, which we get from these uh, hydrodynamic uh, solvers, uh, linear hydrodynamic solvers. And then we adapt it, but we adapt it within the, the, the context of a fully nonlinear computational fluid dynamics numerical wave tank simulation. So the simulation is as realistic as, as we can get it. Uh, and of course, we can uh, handle hard constraints uh, via uh, collocation points as well in this case. So if we look at the, this is the overall control solution, but the only part that's really interesting, I guess, is that First of all, the simulation is a high fidelity simulation. It uses computational fluid dynamics, which takes a long time to compute, but it's high fidelity. Uh, this is where the, the real action is, which is the optimal control calculation. And then we adapt the model uh, in this box here, which we, we seed or initialize uh, with a linear model that essentially comes from Cummins equation. And looking at some of the solutions then, these are some solutions for the different uh, coefficients of the M and N matrices, which form the system model in the pseudo spectral world. And you can see that they, I, I haven't shown them all here, but just the selection. And you can see that some of them just keep varying as we move around the operational space, while some actually converge, which means that, you know, I, I guess in the linearized world, uh, they're reasonably okay, but are, are initialized with, uh, with the wrong parameters. So they, 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 they you know, th those parameters sort of divide into those two categories. And if we look at the effect on, uh, the displacement of the device uh, and the uh, normalized energy. Uh, you can see that uh, the adaptive uh, model actually does does a little bit better in terms of being a little more conservative in its use of the, the displacement. And that's probably also going to mean a little less wear and tear on the device. But in fact, it does produce more energy. And, and you know, as, uh, as it adapts and some of the parameters are continuously adapting, you know, after about 25, 30 seconds, we're getting probably about 10% more energy, which is, is a significant uh, uh, bonus. This is one other uh, database control solution, uh, which uses Q-learning. Um, it, it, it has uh, a parametric controller, so the control force is parameterized in terms of the system uh, velocity and position using these two parameters. So. What's determined from the Q-learning are these two uh, controller parameters. So the controller has got a parametric form. The objective function is, is uh, average power. Um, and the way, display, the, the, way the um, constraints are handled is that a penalty is applied when the max displacement exceeds a pre-specified value. But it, it actually results in conservative control because this is a very sort of a, a broad or average control and if you want to make sure that all of the system uh, operation is within the constraints, then even at times that you could relax the constraints, you can't because it's got such a long averaging period. And uh, for this particular study, a linear simulation model was adopted. So I guess, uh, you know, it's not clear exactly how realistic that might be. And then finally, as a sort of a nod towards extremum seeking control, uh, remember that what we're trying to do is to uh, maximize the converted power. This is mechanical power, the integral of force times velocity. And if we look at the performance evaluation of this quantity here for 10, 100, and 1,000 sort of nominal peak wave periods, um, 
then we we get these sort of uh, plots here and and what's plotted here are the sort of optimal control parameters if if they're the parameters that multiply um, velocity and position just just to get something we can plot into in three dimensions and you can see that really it's not until you get to about a thousand peak wave periods that you're getting a smooth function and again you know uh, if we think about something like extreme seeking control we need smooth functions in order to get our, our uh, guarantees of convergence. So some progress has been made, I think, towards data-driven control. Um, so there are a small number of extremum seeking wet control studies, but you'll see that in, in the true sense, they're not entirely data-driven. Um, in in uh, reference 39 here, there are five different extremum seeking algorithm studies, which are based on, on different types of algorithms. Uh, the self-driving one is one which uses the natural excitation in the system, uh, but all the others use an additional external perturbation, of course, which uh, uh, guarantees uh, convergence in the extremum seeking world. Uh, and then there is some attention to constraints, uh, but in general, um, they're not hard constraints, they're soft constraints, which lead to some conservatism in the solution. And all of those solutions use a, a parametric form of controller where the control force is parameterized in terms of two parameters. Sorry, that does a mistake there, it should be teeth of two. And they typically employed filtering uh, so that, you know, there's some moving average or low pass filtering of the objective function, which uh, really limits the immediacy of the control action. So finally, then, uh, some perspective. So uh, in, in general, uh, what I've tried to show you is that as you move from the Navier-Stokes equations to simplified models, really, we, we, we ditch a lot of important assumptions. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, it, it makes it very difficult then to, to understand the uh, sort of validity uh, of the, the studies that we're doing. So wide operation ranges, the controller actually violates the uh, uh, linearizing assumptions and uh, complex computation. The optimal control solution itself is non-causal. Um, Energy-based control is, is well known in, in solar and wind, and there are plenty of extremum seeking solutions. So maybe we can do the same for wave energy. Uh, perhaps uh, we don't need an additional perturbation signal as is required in most extremum seeking scenarios because we have this persistent uh, wave excitation force. And that also may help us uh, to converge faster because we're not uh, stuck to the time scale associated with those perturbations. But there are challenges. So uh, a long integration period to gather, gather the wave uh, statistics, uh, as I've shown you in the, the, those uh, plots of the uh, objective function. How can we implement hard constraints? And um, can we guarantee convergence of an extremum seeking algorithm in the absence of a prescribed external perturbation? Or maybe there are conditions on this external perturbation that, that, that uh, give us a guarantee. And there's a fundamental limitation in using a, that ACC or feedback structure to solve the non-causal control problem. Um, you know, this is probably beyond the scope of this talk, but there are a whole variety of different wave energy devices. So there's no generic model or no generic problem uh, to deal with either. And finally, let me just mention that if anyone is interested in getting into this area, we have some uh, PhD and postdoc positions as well. So I know I've gone very close to time. So I'll just say thanks very much for your attention.